Nick graduated with a BBA in entrepreneurship from Wilkes University and worked on aeroponic systems and spearheaded mushroom plant research at the plant by building a unique pasteurizing system. Nick's an avid tinkerer and is always building something new. He leads the overall direction and design of Urban Rivers Wild Mile, the world's first ever floating park to be set to be complete in 2020 in the North Branch Canal of the Chicago River, as well as the Trash Robot, the world's first ever user-controlled trash collection device. So without any further ado, please welcome Nick Wesley. All right, how's it going? So uh, thank you guys for having me. I'm extraordinarily excited to uh, be here. Uh, my name is Nick Wesley. I'm a co-founder in Urban Rivers, and uh, thank you for that warm introduction. So, you know, to get started, you know, part of, uh, throughout cities throughout the world, we have um, a kind of a common denominator with rivers. You know, it's normally an important piece, and water in general is an important piece of cities and how they develop and how they kind of live. And we're at a kind of a time where um, I think it's, it's really interesting. We can really rethink what the role of a river within these environments uh, should be. And um, I'm here to talk of one of our approaches uh, to this. So, you know, if you look at just how uh, kind of uh, the cities work, you know, you have the residents, you have a built environment, skyscraper streets, you know, all that. And then you have the natural world. And currently it's a little bit out of balance. We have a lot more um, city streets buildings and we're, we've kind of neglected uh, the environment to a certain extent. And, I think that our rivers are a really interesting opportunity to try to um, make this a little bit more of a harmonious uh, balance. So, you know, cities kind of copy each other. They look for good ideas and they take them and um, try to adapt them to their own situation. Around the Industrial Revolution, it became extraordinarily important to be able to move goods quickly and efficiently through your cities um, and to other ports and, and, and rivers. So, you know, kind of the goal then was to then optimize these systems for that purpose. So we tried to find every little way which we could uh, save some time, make it easier for boats to moor to the edges. And, you know, that was kind of, the, that was the goal. And so this shot right here is taken um, of the straightening of the Chicago River right south around Roosevelt Street. Um, so, you know, every little piece, you know, we would spend billions of dollars and, 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 you know, millions of man hours to try to change it just a little bit to make it better. Um, and, you know, it made some sense at the time. I mean, you want, you had a, a system which looked like this, which had a lot of uh, large boats moving through. Um, and so, you know, to, to, to save that and to, to make it more efficient, that's really, you know, was good at the time. But this isn't really what we see nowadays when we look at the Chicago River. You know, it doesn't bustle with uh, large ships. You know, we have highways and, and railroad systems that do a lot of what the uh, kind of uh, ports would do. So, you know, we, we kind of, um, the, use is, the use is waned. And now I think there's a, a, another way we can kind of approach this. On top of that, besides shipping, the second thing we use this as is a, um, a waste stream. So we, at, we reverse the Chicago River in order to be able to dump sewage in it without necessarily it going into Lake Michigan. And, you know, and unfortunately for St. Louis, that was, that was what we decided. So, um, you know, we put a lot of effort into, into, you know, channelizing this and making it so that the flow would, would reverse out. And then we could more or less, as Chicagoans at least, could dump their sewage in the water and, and not have to really deal with it. Um, and, you know, around the you know, and this, these are some of the, uh, some photos from the MWRD of people uh, working on it, both extending it um, and, and shaping the river as well as, you know, digging things that are similar to it as they would uh, kind of dig that kind of channel beneath. So we put a ton of effort into this, this whole project. But the whole time, really, something that wasn't factored in at all was the natural environment. You know, when you widen the river, when you destroy the, the bank systems, you know, you kind of lose a lot of what makes the river uh, a functional ecosystem. And then on top of that, when you decide to dump three million uh, people's worth of sewage, it, it really does a, a number on it. So 
you know, but I think there's been a shift. So around the 1970s, you know, we started to see like, okay, like this, this is totally unsustainable. We can't really do this. This isn't, you know, we have to at least make an effort to try to uh, curb how much sewage we dump in. And so the MWRD started on the deep tunnel and reservoir project, which is just just a, a, a giant infrastructure project. And it's basically a big pool where you can store all of the sewage before it flows, before dumping in the river. So you could treat it and you know, whatnot. So it's, it's a step in the right direction. And it kind of marks the, uh, our willingness to invest in the infrastructure that it takes to really um, stop some of these practices. So, you know, like we still though, e even with all this, we still face a ton of challenges. You know, you have on top of the sewage and things like that, you have non-point source pollution. So everything that's in your streets, you know, when it rains, all the oil slicks and, you know, cigarette butts and things like that, when it rains, it, that's where it goes is the river. It, it finds its way there eventually. So, you know, when Right now, you know, we, with, even with the deep water, uh, the deep tunnel project and these other things, when we get rain events, what ends up happening is you get uh, sewage back into the river, raw sewage. And so when there's, I think, uh, two thirds of an inch of rain, it, um, it starts to uh, pour in. And then if it gets over around one and a half inches, um, it starts actually going to the lake. So we start to get that negative effect. And, you know, this depends a little bit on how much it's the rate of which it's rained or whatever and how full the reservoirs are. But, you know, it, it, we have these events uh, multiple times per year where, where raw sewage is dumped in. So, you know, there's still kind of things that we face. And we kind of, you know, people's perception of how to use the river still isn't entirely there. I mean, this is a shot of uh, 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 some people who were working along the river who were basically dumping what's most likely just mud and maybe a little bit of concrete in. But it kind of marks that, like, uh, you know, the, the kind of, non-appreciation of this, this asset. So, um, you know, on top of that, I, I touched a little bit on, you know, a lot of rivers are polluted from agriculture runoff. You have, you know, farms with a lot of different fertilizers. When it rains, you know, the excess stuff flows into the rivers and, you know, really neutrifies it. And Chicago River, um, although not entirely uh, because of this, we, we have a very neutrified river, you know, very high um, uh, uh, nitrogen content, very high phosphorus. And, and so it's got a lot of basically fertilizers in it, which are not the best thing to have. It's not really, it kind of leaves it out of balance. So um, yeah, so this is a typical site of what you'll see in the Chicago River and, and, and honestly rivers throughout the world. So you have these steel sheet pile edges, you have this you know, kind of murky, turbid water, and you don't have any real plants or wildlife in it. And for fish and, and other animals, you know, this is like a, uh, it's basically like a hallway. It has a very muddy bottom without much texture. It's not really the best place to be. So even with a lot of the efforts in curbing some of the pollution that we put in, curbing the sewage that we dump, there's still really no habitat. And that's um, you know, something that I think uh, should change. So this is the project that we installed in uh, 2017. So it's these floating garden modules which attach to the existing infrastructure um, and they grow plants out the top. The roots then grow right through the uh, floating modules and into the water and it really creates this kind of environment which uh, but, uh, plants uh, and other animals can actually use and, and really starts to create a functional ecosystem and resemble something which is like uh, what we might have seen in the Chicago River, you know, 200 years ago. So that kind of leads to our, to the wild mile. So the wild mile, the concept behind it is, you know, we want to build a floating eco park on the east side of Goose Island, uh, which is just, a, it's a really interesting place to do this type of project. So, you know, we started off, our organization started off by uh, launching uh, a Kickstarter to kind of fund the first gardens, those ones right there, um, as well as getting uh, some other uh, corporate grants to kind of do this piece. And, you know, it's really kind of taken off. And now we have um, the city of Chicago involved and uh, some other groups to really kind of create this space. And people really see the value in, in building um, a floating eco park in the heart of uh, Chicago. So a bit about Goose Island and Goose Island's history. So, it is not a natural island. 
Um, like many pieces of the river, it was kind of optimized for human use. And so unlike the straightening that you see down in Roosevelt, they decided to just keep the other side. And so you have uh, this channel, which some people call um, the Ogden Channel, uh, dug by Ogden for a, a big part was to get bricks. Uh, they used that, uh, you know, the excavation to get bricks to build things. And they also used it to um, uh, move boats, obviously, efficiently through instead of having to go all the way around this island. You know, you could just kind of cut right through there. And that's, that's nice. It's a hard angle to point at. But um, yeah, so, it, you know, it's, it, it was dug around the, uh, the 1850s to, to, for those purposes. And, um, you know, we started this. This is Josh Allen, uh, another co-founder, who um, started doing research on how these uh, floating habitats would affect uh, the ecosystem. How would they affect um, the basically fish populations? So we use this floating uh, wetland system which this model, we actually don't use the same model anymore, but this one is basically made up of a, a very fibrous mat uh, that's spun together. It, it, it's a plastic mat that has um, a lot of surface area, and then you put plants inside of it, and then um, they grow through. And it also has a lot of room for uh, bacteria and other things to grow within it, so it really creates this, this interesting ecosystem. And so his... Uh, study was to see how this affected um, fish populations. Were they more attracted to this floating garden than um, under, say, a dock or an open space of river? So he kind of embarked on this. What he was able to find was a, a statistical significant amount more fish were underneath there um, than the floating dock or the open water. Um, so that was, you know, a good kind of nugget where we're like, okay, this is this is interesting, it's effective, you know, it, it needs more research and more kind of uh, uh, implementation to really see how well this thing can affect in these urban waterway systems. So in, fast forward to 2017, this was the first install we did. So basically the way that these things work and the way we kind of see this, this whole system is, you know, we want to create a modular approach where uh, we can start to add on pieces and kind of put it all together um, to change our river. So we could start to slowly build it out and put it in different places and really make it a, a diverse ecosystem. So we have um, our, uh, our uh, we, we basically decided to, as well, the, you know, make this a big experiment. So we tested over 50 different plant species to really see how they fared in this environment. Um, so these mats, and I'll get to that in a second, exactly what they're made of, but they're basically uh, they, there's no soil. It's, it's coconut husk, which is mostly inert. And then um, the roots take all of their nutrients uh, from the actual river itself, which um, thanks to dumping sewage and other things, it's, it's very fertilized. So, you know, it's, um, the plants, they love it. Um, but yeah, so the roots grow right underneath. And you can see in this kind of image right here, you see, you know, fish, they, they really like the structure. You know, that's one of the things that's lacking completely. And that's what um, you know, we believe is why they liked uh, the first wrap, the you know, five by 10 foot module and why they were so kind of attracted to that. So they get to hide in the roots, they eat the roots, uh, they breed on the roots, and it, it really creates this cool, cool spot, which is unlike a lot of the places within the river. So they, it attracts them, it starts to, you know, you start to get populations, you start to get bait fish hanging out there, you start to get predator fish hanging out there, and then you get, you know, things like uh, uh, birds that are then uh, hunting these fish, and it, and it really creates this cool, cool ecosystem kind of around this place. And lucky for us, since there's not much habitat in the river, the, the results are immediately kind of uh, visible. And, it, and it's, it's compared to other places, you could see the, the difference. And so um, hopefully that won't be for very long. Hopefully most of the river looks the same. And then you know our incremental gains will be incremental instead of uh, as they are. But so we, te we tested out different um, zones of plants. So Part of it, you know, one of the things we did is test different pollinator sections. So we put um, different plants, um, uh, you know, milkweed, um, uh, queen of the prairie, and other, other plants that would attract bees, uh, dragonflies, uh, and other, other pollinators that, to this area uh, and, and to see how they did. We did emergent species, which are species that kind of grow into the water to create kind of cool structures and, uh, you know, um, different different areas for uh, butterflies and things like that. And we, we also tested, uh, just for fun, 
um, a river ponic section, which is a, a food garden. So we put um, kale, tomatoes, uh, squash, uh, and some other leafy greens and things in, in there to see how they would grow. And then um, at the end of the season, we sent them to a lab to test to see what types of heavy metals and pollutants were in them. Um, most of them were surprisingly OK. Kale had uh, more lead than you would really want to eat. But um, it, was, it, you know, it was interesting to, to kind of see that result. But besides those plants, everything else is are native to Illinois. So we take a, a lot of time and effort into making sure we're sourcing the plants uh, from within a, a very small radius, which is, I, I think, pretty important to really developing these species. Because then once you have these kind of environments within here, you know, you get seeds, and the seeds then uh, use the river as transportation, and they move out throughout other areas and other banks, which I think is um, exciting. So this is the installation right after we installed it. So you can notice kind of some of the structure around these uh, units. So they're basically this coconut husk, uh, coconut choir mats um, rolled in. You then have these kind of uh, slots, which you just put the plants in. Um, oops. Um, and then, and you know, you can see it's, it's fairly bare, you know, you can see a lot of the structure around it, but you know, after, this is the year, the next season, you know, they really fill out this whole thing, and, and because of, you know, the high nutrient content, these things, they just, they go nuts, it's great. And so, you know, you start to see that once, the, the whole structure itself more or less disappears, and it kind of becomes this, or emulates this, you know, semi-natural setting. So that, that's about a year in. So um, you know, now we're kind of at phase two, which is how do we bring more people um, to the river? So how do we get more people involved in this thing? And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about a, a partnership we had with uh, the British School. But you know, we wanted to create, and this is a, a project we collaborated with the city on, is to create this, this idea of this learning platform, which is actually a floating walkway, which you can bring an entire classroom down to actually experience the river, um, you know, plant different plants, uh, do different uh, habitat experiments and things like that. So it was the first node to really getting humans interacting with uh, the Chicago River in, in a really intimate way. Um, one thing that we face, uh, a problem throughout the entire river, is, is access. Um, there's not, again, the, the river was built for shipping. So these boats are taller, so most of the seawalls are up you know, eight, nine feet. So it's not easy to get down. And this building this area wasn't easy at all to, to set up. You know, we have a, a ramp, which, um, you know, it's ADA compliant, so it has to have a very low grade. So we had basically an 80-foot ramp to get down to the actual waterway, which was, um, it's, it's tough. And it's, it's tough to do this. It, it's, something, but it's something that should happen throughout the whole thing. So we then, once people then are able to get down to the water's edge, you can experience the water. You can see some of the issues that it has up front, and you kind of you're invested in it, rather than what I think the old paradigm was, where people basically you have industrial systems, warehouses with their backs facing the river, and it's not really seen as just uh, it's not a focal point. It's something that you just kind of go over and you don't really notice it too much. And by creating more access, you kind of highlight some of the challenges and also highlight some of the benefits of the system and what how this could kind of interact with people's lives and you know, really start to change the, the momentum and, and thought process around these things. So learning platform uh, should be installed in uh, July, uh, pending a few Army Corps uh, approvals. So it's a whole other thing is, is getting through regulation to get some of these things in. It's, it's, a, it's a long process. Um, oh, this is right uh, on the east side of Goose Island. So this is the Eastman Street. So there's an REI that actually just opened up. So this is outside the REI. Um, so they put in the, the floating walkway down and things like that. And then these gardens and stuff, you know, pending this approval, we'll get to go in uh, in July or maybe August. So uh, hopefully July, I've been waiting a while. But uh, yeah. And so, um, let's see if this works. No, okay, that's okay. So uh, it wasn't gonna be a nice, nice drone thing, but this, you get the picture. So this channel itself is really interesting because if you, um, if you look at a lot of the river, but most of it is still used by some bar traffic. In, in our area, there's um, basically two operators who actually move things uh, through the area. And so, um, but on this east side of Goose Island, 
There is not. It's too shallow. Um, it's never been, it hasn't been dredged in, in decades. The bridges are too low. So you really kind of create this area where it's like, okay, you can't use commercial boats through, so you don't have to worry about that whole, that, 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 that whole user base. So you can, it gives a lot more room to kind of experiment and to grow things out. And it makes permitting a heck of a lot easier, uh, which was a, a real benefit uh, of this area. And, it, and it's also isolated. You have another side of the river where people can go through, and then you have this one area which can then be really dedicated uh, to wildlife, to this uh, ecosystem restoration, as well as to creating kind of environments for people to, to enjoy this, this kind of holistic experience. Um, yeah, and so, um, you know, it's on top of just being a, a park place where people can kind of go, congregate, walk around, it's also, I think, a really interesting way to reach people about the importance of their ecosystems. You know, part of um, one of the downsides of living in a city is there's not much, uh, there's not much habitat. It's hard to find places to go. You can go to places like the Forest Preserve and things like that, and you know, Lincoln Park Zoo. But you know, there needs to be more areas where you can kind of learn about these these ecosystems. And another benefit of this whole thing is these floating gardens and and floating and other experiments that we're doing are fairly new. So when we get students involved in this kind of stuff, you're actually really contributing to the progress of these ideas, which I think is unique in, in terms of um, you know, the, the impact that, that, that one student's efforts could actually have on the, the broader kind of goal of, of changing how these, these rivers are. So that's, I think, a really cool piece. And, and as well as it's, you, get there, you get to go down on a kayak, and that's, that's always fun, and it's a, it's a cool way to kind of interact with a park, too. Um, so, on top of that, we have uh, different research initiatives going on. So one of the, our teammates, Phil Nicodemus, is doing um, a study, uh, a mesoclasm experiment, and this is at uh, Botanic Garden right now, where they have uh, these vats, and he's basically studying how these roots are growing underneath in these vats, and we actually trucked up a bunch of Chicago River water to try to make this as accurate as possible. And so they, basically you have these floating, the floating gardens and you have the plants and, and you go and you test out um, what he's testing out different bacterias and things like that that are growing on these roots and seeing you know, how the ecosystem is, can be affected by that, what they're, uh, you know, how fast these roots grow and it, it really gives some insight. And on top of that we have other researchers doing different studies about you know, bats, um, different studies about water quality in the area. So it's, it's a cool place to really create this uh, you know, environment where people can study new things, test new things that are in our urban waterways and really start to push this innovation on how do we engage these systems um, and get data behind it, which I think is extremely important. So on top of that, it's, it's, a, it's a recreational asset. Um, people can go through, you can kayak down and when you kind of get in this area, if you ever go down it, um, it's, it's unique to Chicago. You're kind of nestled between this like forgotten land where there's, you know, on one side you have waste management and some other uh, warehouses and the other it's kind of overgrown parking lots and things. And so, but then framed in it, you see the, the Sears Tower. So you're kind of in the city, but then uh, a little more isolated and you could kind of stroll through and it's a completely different pace. So. You know, I think that being able, the ability to let somebody, you know, take a, a Sunday afternoon and really just mosey through, I think could be is really beneficial to to a lot of people in creating more environment around that, more interesting, uh, you know, plants and animals that people can observe. I think will will help others appreciate nature and also give people kind of a, that nice uh, escape that you'd like to find in the city. Um, so so far. Um, you know, it's kind of, the reception has been great. We've been able to get a, a couple cool partnerships with uh, Shad Aquarium and, and some other groups to really put these things in. Um, and so it's, it's something that I think, you know, just from the response we hear, it's, it's something that people want to see in other parts of the river and in other parts of the world. So it, it, it's great to kind of push that and see where, what, what people want to see from the city and from the river. So um, that's a whole exciting thing. The team, um, the way that these types of things get done is it's not a, you know, it, it's something that you kind of, uh, 
You know, you have like a, a temporary insanity where you just decide to devote an exorbitant amount of time to this, this, this one project. And that's the way that I think this thing is, has progressed over the years. You know, we have, um, you know, there's uh, two other co-founders, and then we've had uh, dozens of different volunteers who've came through and, at, at different points in time and really, really helped push this thing forward. So that's one of the, the other interesting things is you get people who come to these, this project for completely different reasons and really help advance the whole mission and uh, vision of what, what we should do with our rivers and how we should kind of approach that. So, you know, it's great to see groups of, you know, really talented individuals kind of come together to, to do these types of projects and, you know, really uh, just, just spend a ton of time going through some of the things that, you know, not, not the sexy parts of, uh, of uh, river conservation, things like permitting and, uh, you know, grant writing and that fun side of things, but it's great. So, um, yeah, so the, um, this is a little bit, um, the video won't play, but the, so the, we did, on top of the education initiative, so you, we have the learning platform, and one of the ways that we kind of got to this idea was through a collaboration with the British School. So uh, it's a school that's right by um, this area. It's like two blocks from the floating gardens, and basically it's a, it was a group of uh, fifth graders who spent the semester learning about river ecology, learning about the Chicago River, and then actually, at the end of it, were, chose the plants that they wanted to see in there, uh, had a, a couple gardens, uh, these modules, planted them, installed them, and, um, really, and then monitored them later on in the year. So kind of seeing this, this whole thing progress and how interested kind of the kids were with this process and how invested they are afterwards, it really is a great point to get this next generation really interested in the river, in the Chicago River, and in its future. So at this point, you know, this was a year ago that we installed it. Now these students are starting to do more experiments and creating different monitoring aspects in it. The kids are really proud and check it out all the time to see the progress of it and how things are growing, what's, what's going on. So it's a great way to really, I guess, shift the perception of what the Chicago River is, what, what is its use in our city um, with people who, um, you know, many of which will be living here their entire lives. So after this, you know, the British school is, is, a, is a pretty fortunate school. They were able to, to do this, but we want to then bring this to more, uh, more kids. We want this to be an extraordinarily open way that people can then start to do different experiments, start to plant some of these gardens, and that's what kind of brought the learning platform into the into fruition. This the place is then a place where then anybody can go down to the river and kind of ha do different experiments. You could get students in in full classrooms able to then uh, learn about things in in class, come down for a field trip, and then be part of this this cool um, experiment. So. You know, among our other uh, our volunteers, we could have done it with a lot of different groups. So we were able to, um, you know, a lot of these organizations were able to kind of come together for different projects and different pieces of this this thing to to really bring it into fruition. Um, Shadow, one of the partnerships that we had, which is real fun, we did uh, the Shed Island, and we did two of those, um, which are or doing another one this year, which are basically gardens that are installed. Um, in the water, they have different habitat structures, and then they are able to bring out a group of uh, uh, people each week, to a, a couple of times each week, to then learn about this the habitat, and as well as contribute to some of the uh, citizen science that kind of goes on in there. So they do different data monitoring and collection pieces um, on these gardens, so te testing out different. Uh, the, we have water. The wa I was mentioning some of the researchers that are doing like water quality testing and. Uh, different uh, experiments with uh, bat habitat. So the researchers from the Shed and also from our River Ranger program, our groups that actually come down, collect that data that is then used in some of this research. So it's kind of a really cool way to um, bring people in the fold on how, it, and really on the front lines of how this thing's changing and how it kind of is adapting. And so, you know, this is an island right there. So you can see that little flag that's got it. So, um, and I'll go into it in a sec, but it, we, another experiment we tried to do with floating trees. So we saw this, um, some really cool projects um, out of uh, uh, Denmark and Amsterdam, which 
seems where a lot of the really, really cool river projects start. Um, but they had some really nice floating tree things. And you know, we were thinking about how can we do this ourselves? How can we get these kind of larger uh, objects in? So we worked with uh, the person who creates these, these gardens to, to build these uh, tree modules that then we planted um, different, uh, different trees in to see you know, uh, swamp white oak and a couple others uh, to see how they really would fare in the system. Um, and you know, as uh, science goes sometimes, uh, we actually had them eaten by beavers this year. So uh, you know, we got to replace these, I guess. But at the same time, it's a, uh, it's a good thing to know that beavers are alive and, and really a part of the, the ecosystem here. And get a little tree in, and they're, they're happy. So um, you know, experiment to go as we planned, but we fed some beavers. I'm sure they, sure they needed it. So uh, what, what's next, I guess, in this whole equation? What do we do? What do, we do? Where are we going with this? So we, you know, the Wild Mile uh, as a place is something that uh, the city of Chicago has uh, started to, to take notice of and has really partnered uh, and created the, this, this concept called the Wild Mile Framework Plan, which is a, a group we're a part of along with um, a couple of Skidmoreans, um, Omni Ecosystems, OH Community Partners, and a couple other groups who are really planning out how would this look as a full system? Like, what's the, the larger principles of this whole place? And then how do you make sure that everybody who's building on this properties can kind of get involved in, and, and be a part of this? So an interesting thing, unlike most parks, is it's not, you can't just buy the land. It's very, the regu how the river is split up is, is interesting and different than, than a lot of places. So the seawall itself is owned by um, the property owners. So in order to get this thing going, you have to have buy-in from every single um, property owner that goes through there. So, you know, to create this framework plan and this, this idea so that everybody along this channel understands what's going on and wants to actually be a part of the solution is, is a real interesting way and a real interesting role that the city's kind of gotten involved in. Um, so, um, you know, on top of that, we mentioned the, the trash bot. Um, so, you know, we, we're, we're looking for experiments and innovation in, the, in these river systems. So one of the things you see is trash fills up the river. You know, it, it, it gets really dirty. Um, and you kind of, you want to get rid of it. And one of the ways that, the kind of way that most fit projects and things kind of deal with this is by creating, you know, nice slanted edges which don't collect trash, which is, it, it kind of, it's kind of beside the point because that one, you know, can moves then throughout the entire system and, you know, probably eventually in St. Louis and maybe even the Gulf. But so, you know, you want to then take the opportunity to, to catch this stuff. So we had some of these hard edges where, you know, we knew that we would get some trash. We weren't sure how much and we, we wanted to see. So we found that they filled up uh, really quick and really irregularly. So we would see just trash piled up in them. And so we're like, okay, well, how do we get rid of this? So we, um, we volunteers go out every day to, to remove this trash. But what we found is, you know, the river itself doesn't just move one way. It, it kind of moves back and forth depending on the wind and depending on the lock settings uh, set by the MWRD. So you would get an hour there, someone would clean up a little bit of trash to be, okay, it's done. And then like two hours later, it would just be filled, inundated. And then a couple hours later, it would be completely gone. So we're like, okay, we need some sort of solution that's always on, something that will allow us to get into these nooks and crannies um, in real time as the trash kind of builds up and as it flows past our stuff as well and catch it. So um, that's kind of where the idea of the, the trash bot kind of initiated. And then we thought, okay, how can we, we're, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna be sitting there all day on this thing. How do we kind of activate uh, more people to, to be a part of the solution? And so the way that this works is it's a, it's a floating, it's a, a remote controlled uh, robot which drives around, has a camera on it, and then um, people around the world can actually just control it from their computers. So it allows kind of this, this virtual volunteering in a way where you don't have to, you know, get in a kayak, suit up in gloves, and you know, know that you're cleaning up stuff where sewage is. You could just sit, you know, at your home, take five minutes and, and check it out. So it's, um, it's a cool, I think, approach to this whole concept and really immersing people in this environment uh, in, a, in a unique way. Um, you know, so that's a nice little shot of the prototype above. 
Um, on top of that, I touched a little bit, these are some of the floating tree modules. So basically it's like a, a planter box type situation, mulch, and this one actually does have soil in it. Um, but then the roots grow out and there's, there's space for the roots to kind of grow out sideways and really kind of create this, um, what we hope will be a, a large tree. And when a lot of these modules are kind of strung together, you know, we'll see where the kind of upper limit on how, how big these things can grow. Um, but the, I guess the first consideration now is, uh, you know, how, how do we have to protect from beavers to make sure that it, it can actually grow. But uh, just uh, part of it. And so, you know, it, this, our solution, Urban River solution and, and the Wild Mouse solution to this issue um, is kind of one part in a larger picture. Um, you know, as our rivers are now all in a kind of similar state, most rivers are in, uh, I, actually, I think, I think it is actually 100% of urban rivers are in a subpart ecological state, you know. So how do you start to shift that? And how do you take something that goes to the heart of the most densely populated cities on earth, something that just cuts right through, and how do you turn that into an ecological asset that is then, can then be enjoyed by residents and, and, and animals alike? So I think this, this is one solution to it, but one of the most fun parts is the other projects which are going on throughout the, throughout the world. So you have things like Flusspot in Berlin, which is a, a floating swimming pool that's filtered by uh, plants and you know, other projects and going on in the Thames and um, you know, New York and things like that. So it's, it's, it's kind of a conversation that's starting to evolve. And you know, really, I think that 20, 30 years from this point, a lot of these projects will have been developed. A lot of the best practices will have been established. And people will see the river in the same way, see the river as, as this ecological asset that's, that's extremely important and fundamental to, to the community around it and forget about the kind of industrial past that it used to be and really see this as, as what it should be, which is a, a part of all of our lives. So um, that's another last render of the Wild Mile. Um, and you can see that's like the, where the learning platform is. That's the waste management, the, the, the typical edge condition. So. Um, yeah, uh, thank you guys, and I think uh, we'll take a break and then uh, go to questions. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, great presentation. I am curious if, uh, if there has been ever any involvement with, between Urban Rivers and the Chicago Park District, especially like Ping Tong Park, and also the Riverwalk. And also what the considerations are for the more like downtown parts of the river branches yeah. for the future. Thanks. Yeah. So, it, you know, initially when we were kind of doing the fact finding mission of this, this project, you know, we talked to different people at the park district to really see how this works. I, they're not too keen on adopting more spaces and, it, and it's kind of a, a different situation than most of their parks, but I mean, they, they support, they like the idea and, and all of that. I think the, um, you know, as you start to get in certain areas like the Riverwalk and things where it's more, um, there's more physical land and then, you know, river things, I think they'll be more involved. And I see for just general development of these areas, I mean, the solution of taking any flat edge and adding habitat to it, I think can be applied in the entire river. And so what part of the thing that we are hoping to do with the whole project is really inspire others and show what uh, what, what approach to take. And so I think that the kind of thing that will come out of this is more people will see, wow, this is not that hard to do. It's, it's, it's pretty beneficial. Let's do it in all these other sections of, uh, of the river. So that's what we're hoping for. Um, yeah. Hi, great presentation. Um, I'm out on the river a lot and I'm excited about this. Are there gonna be do you know if the REI dock is going to be public or will there be other public docks where you can put in closer to the Wild Mile? Because yeah. Park Park's kind of a hike from there. And yeah. yeah, no, so um, the REI dock will be public. So that area, um, initially with the project, we were trying to put that launch on Eastman Street so that it's like very visual that this is, it's, it's a public open space. Um, but the Eastman Street seawall is, and this is part of the, like the river as it changes, is just old wood that's really deteriorating. So it couldn't 
the way to do, the way where you, you have to do this is like basically a flyover, a cantilevered edge that goes down. And that soil and it couldn't support it. It would just add just a, a tremendous amount of costs. So, um, you know, it's now on the edge of uh, the REI property. But yeah, that's public and it will be an open launch space. And, um, you know, the, part, the next phase in the wild mile after the learning platform is to connect this to uh, Weed Street, which is right north of Whole Foods, and make that kind of a loop. And that will also um, be uh, an access point. So, yeah. Hi, thanks, Nick. Um, I love rivers. I grew up on the Mississippi in St. Paul, and I live right off the North Branch in Albany Park yeah. um, near Von Steuben High School. Um, and so that river, as you mentioned, floods a lot, right? There, you know, two thirds of an inch, and sewage gets released, and the water just keeps overflowing the banks. Um, and Chicago's solution has been to build deep reservoirs. We now have a mile-long tunnel from um, Pulaski and Foster all the way over to the channel. But other cities have taken different approaches, like Philadelphia has gone with a more permeable pavement, so thinking of themselves as more of a sponge. And I'm wondering, as you've looked at rivers around the world, um, what you think about, um, you know, do we need to have a fundamental shift in how we think about where rainwater goes? Um, how many more deep tunnels can we keep building? No, I think that's a great point. You know, you have to have, you have to create a system that kind of resembles a real ecosystem. And so, you know, when it rains in, in the woods, it, it gets absorbed, it sits there. It doesn't all, you know, sit on some rock and move to areas, except, I guess, places that are made of mostly stone. But, uh, you know, it, it is, I think that's, a, that's the next thing we have to do. And I know there's, uh, Friends does a lot of advocation to, towards, you know, doing permanent mobile pavement and things like that. And I think that type of solution is what's gonna have to happen. Part of kind of what I wanted to get at with the, the deep reservoir, the deep tunnel project, and the kind of juxtaposition with what we're doing is that's one thought of how to just physically treat the water in like a, a, a really kind of like lab setting, more or less. Whereas what we're doing is trying to create an ecosystem which then will have the beneficial properties of filtering water itself. And I think having um, permeable pavement, having different areas and collection areas throughout the city where then when it rains, when things happen, you know, to, to really emulate that before it gets there is just going to be, that's what needs to happen because it, you just, you're right, you're just going to build deeper and deeper tunnel projects and it's not going to really hit the actual problem entirely of why our river is the way it is. So, yeah. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, you're saying, <clears throat> excuse me, how there was a learning center. Um, how do you get past, like for me initially, like it's a floating garden. How, how do you get the public to understand how safe it is and what is like the weight requirements and limits on these individual yeah. gardens? So it's like, it's similar to just um, like in a marina, like the docks you walk on. So, um, you know, the, um, I think just kind of, making it visually appear like this makes sense to be here, that it's not like some rickety kind of thing on some backwater uh, you know, river. It's like, it looks like it's like built to be there. That's, I think, part of the, the thing. And you know, one of the cool things on, uh, the architect we're working with on this is really thinking about how do you present this in a similar way to other public spaces and make it be something that people then trust. And, and the weight limit uh, is, is Pretty high. It's more like you can't drive cars on it, but you can totally bring as many people as could fit on the rafts, and it's not gonna not gonna go down. But yeah, um, you know, with the way we think about it too is it has to be. It's, it, we use just docks and marinas and things like that as a similar thing, and you have to make people aware that this is. You know, you have ladders and other say O-ring safety things like that, but you have to make people aware that you know this is you're in the water. Like this is a, this is a place to to not just you know blindly walk around. You have to be present in what you're doing. So I think that's part of the, the signaling that will help with this. Yeah. Hi, um, awesome talk, thank you. Um, I, I was just wondering, were there any, since you have private landowners also having to weigh in and having to get all this buy-in, is there generally any pushback that you're experiencing? Is there any like nimbyism? Like, people not wanting to enhance more recreation because they sort of see this as their part of the river, you know, or yeah. anything like that. You know, we don't see too much of that yet. Uh, most people, I mean, it just seems like a natural fit, like, oh, you gotta get this thing better. You know, it's, it's hard to say like, oh, I, you know, just keep the river dirty, you know. It's, hard, it's a hard position to, to back up. But what, what, what we do find though is, is um, 
you know, we had um, Waste Management, who's the other side of uh, Goose Island, and they've they've never they've never been against a project, and, and at this point they're they're supporting of it. But to, when, one of the things when getting the permits is it was just you know it was a kind of a bureaucratic limbo for months. Like we spent probably eight or nine months and got no progress to try to get the permits and the 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 contracts to be able to put this thing in there. And then we decided, okay, we're just going to go to Whole Foods and talk to the property developer that works there who, you know, it was, it was real quick, you know, they basically wanted to mitigate the risk and their liability and make sure that, you know, kind of all the, the bases were covered. And then once that was done, they were like, okay, it was it was approved. And at this point then after Waste Management saw that development, how it went, it was great, now they've signed it. So it's, it's kind of that, and same with getting permits as well. It's a hard process to really get people in tune with the idea um, of what this is, like what, what exactly we're doing, like, you know, that it's gonna like be maintained and not just, we're not just gonna be some fly-by-night operation. So that part of gaining that trust and just be, being here, unfortunately, the only way to do that is more or less longevity. So, you know, working at this for about five years, it, you know, eventually they kind of come around and you kind of get, people are like, oh, well, if they're doing it, you know, there's no problem. So, yeah. Um, and and part, part, of when, part of what I hope too with this project is when we came in and started talking to these, uh, landowners and these these regulators, you know, it, it took a very long time to really get people around the idea of what this is, how they should permit it, how they should look at it. And what I hope is that other groups in both Chicago and other cities can point to this as an example and be like, this is what we're trying to do, something like this. And then it's like, oh, okay, and, and it, it'll help people make those connections too, which I think will kind of limit any pushback or, you know, just, uh, t I guess, uh, resistance of sorts. What is the lifespan of these floating islands? Yeah, so the manufacturer puts them at 25 years uh, as the lifespan of this. And it's, you know, the way that they're made is they're supposed to be, they're basically based off of some of these floating mangrove type islands that you see in like uh, Indonesia and things like that, where you have these uh, plants that grow and the roots grow and they start to then, the roots then replace the medium. So it then starts to create its own floating fibrous mat. And so the, what the manufacturer's goal with this is that they last forever. They, they're basically like more or less a seed that then starts to grow this floating kind of complex structure based on the organic matter of the, the plant. So that's the, that's the idea behind it. I know they haven't had any in their water for, for 25 years, but we'll start to see you know, what happens as it, as it kind of develops. But I'm, I'm confident that it'll last uh, a fairly long time. So, yeah. You mentioned the vegetables and stuff. Do you, do you, are you using them just to analyze them? Or is this a, a possible food distribution, like people that don't have access to these and can't grow them on their own? Yeah, so when... It, one of the ways that I got into this is, um, you know, we were growing aer aeroponic systems. So me and uh, Zach Tabata, who was another co-founder, were building aeroponic units, uh, which are basically like, uh, like hydroponic systems similar, that you could grow on rooftops and things like that. And, you know, eventually we thought like, okay, well, this river is like super nutrified. Can we use that as uh, the fertilizer to then grow plants in these? Can we use these things as that genesis? And then over time, we evolved what we wanted and our goals to, to be much more uh, habitat oriented and, and, and focus on that. But this test was to see how that would fare. Um, I think the perception of growing food in the Chicago River, I don't think we're gonna get over that anytime soon. So I think that's gonna be the biggest barrier to you know, buying like strawberries at the grocery store. On top of that, you know, there's, we tested for a lot of heavy metals, but we haven't tested for everything. So there's, there's other things that could be in these things. But I think the idea of using river runoff water and wastewater and things like that, uh, you know, if done right, I think could be a really useful alternative to fertilizer, especially in, you know, agricultural zones where you're just getting old fertilizer in these things. Like, can you then repipe that and use that for hydroponics and other systems like that? So I think there's a lot of possibility with that, but um, no one's gonna trust the Chicago River strawberry though. Although they're delicious, we, I, we ate a bunch and they were great. So. <laughs> Thanks for a great <clears throat> thanks for a great talk. Um, I'm curious as to what the costs are. What are the initial costs of these mats? 
um, the setup costs. Yeah. So to get started, so I'll, just, I'll just walk you through a real quick story of the, 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 the Genesis thing. So to get started, one of the first groups that was able to support us was Patagonia, who before we were even a 501c3 or anything like that, was, gave us a, a $10,000 grant for this project, this idea. And this was, we were at a point in it where we were like, we were getting the permits and we got to this ID and R permit, which was like $2,600. And we're like, okay, like, you know, we've been doing this out of pocket. This is kind of a, a lot for us right now. And they, we were able to then kind of spend that. So the first kind of piece to it is like actually getting this thing in is, you know, it's about, in terms of we had to get um, structural engineering drugs and other things, it was about like maybe close to 10 grand to just start to get at the gates, which is, I think, crazy for the what type of you know thing we're doing in the type of environment this is in. Um, but then actually installing it, so the big one that you had there was a little under 100K, and that's 166 feet long. It goes out max um, like 12 feet or so into the water. So it's you know a pretty pretty decent sized thing, and so that was that was what that cost was it was a little under 100k to do that piece. Um, however, there are other ways that you can people can do this type of thing without that much money. You know, the the first mat that was done, the five by ten foot, was donated uh, from a company, Floating Islands International. So that was zero dollars, which was great. Um, yeah. So there's different levels and different ways people can kind of build some of these systems to. to Make more sense. Yeah. Thanks. Very interesting. I'm, I'm curious more about the maintenance. Um, down at the harbors, the maintain those floating docks is a million dollars a year. I, I think that's actually an underestimate per year because the winter, it's not the summer, it's the winter. It freezes solid. It disturbs the docks. They have to dig them up and row harbors pulled up and replaced every year. Are you having to do that? What happened when it was minus 40? this winter, so what did the winter look like? And I guess long term, if you weren't maintaining it, would it become destroyed in just a heap of garbage itself that would all break free if all the volunteers decided not to show up one year? Yeah, so this is, that's great. No, so we, when we did the, so a few things. So when we did the float, the five by 10 foot unit, we decided we, it was initially planted with very specific plants, geese, got rid of that idea very quickly. And so then it was all volunteers, so just plants that kind of showed up from throughout the river. And we monitored that to see kind of how this thing would go if you just let it go to nature. Because our area, we're, we're kind of touching it all the time and doing stuff. But like, what do you do in an area where you're just that, you don't have a lot of people going through or, or don't have that. So it, it would grow out pretty well. You get a lot of different volunteer plants and things like that. You have to watch for invasives and stuff. We didn't get, I don't think we got any on that one from that, but you know, that's something you gotta watch, watch out for. So eventually with unmaintained, it could turn into a, a, a lot, of, get a lot of invasives and things like that. It also could turn into kind of its own thing. So um, in terms of how we maintain it, we don't have to take it out. Um, for better or for worse, a lot of the effluent that's dumped into the river warms the thing. So it doesn't freeze in our canal, uh, so our section. So you don't actually, we don't have to deal with big ice flows or things like that, which is, uh, I guess a blessing and a curse at the same time. Um, when it was negative 40, we have a couple cameras out there that broke. So that was that was the the benefit. The bad part about that is our, you know, that broke some of the electronics. But um, for the most part, they they lasted fine. We checked it out, um, and it was you know it, it was pretty good. So in the winter time, I think it's it, it's. It's, it's okay, but for other areas where, and the maintenance itself is minimal. I mean, we have a lot of volunteers who do it and who kind of want to contribute to this, but if you didn't have volunteers, you know, it wouldn't take a, a, an exorbitant amount of time to actually maintain these things. The walkway itself will be a different story. You have to have people, you know, make sure that's clean and all that stuff and keep geese off of it because that's, that can it poop and it's, it, it, it'll fill up real quick. So um, that'll, be a, that'll be a little different type of maintenance, but overall, it's pretty low in terms of, you know, by park standards. Was that dam recently uh, broken up around uh, Albany Park where the river and the, and the canal gets comes together? And if, it, if it did, what's the results of it? You know, I, I, I think it was, and I don't know what, I, I, I don't know what the results were, to be honest. You know, we didn't see, um, yeah, I, I, I couldn't actually tell you, but I think it's a good idea to start to get rid of those things. And, you know, part of what we have in the, part of what they do with the approach with Asian carp in general and, and dams is, you know, it's interesting. You're creating these cutoff points where 
you know, you're stopping things like Asian carp and then the dams, you're stopping a lot of different things, but like, what, you know, fish want to move throughout these whole systems, other animals want to move throughout those. So it's, I, I think as we kind of open up some of these things, you know, I think uh, for better, maybe not the area that the carp are coming in, but it, I think it'll be um, breaking down these dams, especially going up to like Skokie Lagoons, things like that, you know, it, it'll be better to get things that are able to move longer distances and hang out somewhere like our gardens and then move to a different node somewhere else and kind of go throughout the channel. So I think that's a net positive. I'm gonna take the opportunity to ask a question. Um, it's intriguing to me to seem sort of a part of the movement to reuse industrial sites, um, thinking the High Line in New York City yeah. and then the 606 here in Chicago. Um, is there a way to sort of capitalize on that and how do you ultimately how do you get people down there and really make this the kind of um, destination that the 606 has become? Yeah, yeah, so with, in terms of, you know, when we're thinking about, like, like the High Line itself is like the gold standard for how do you take these industrial things. And we, we've talked a lot with them on like their approaches and things like that and kind of trying to f learn from some of their things. And as well as, you know, when you look at like the 606, it's, it's interesting in, in how it's become like a vein of people moving throughout the city. And I think that's a, a really cool concept. Our, our base is so, when we think about it, we look at it more as like the High Line, as a, you know, it's a park, it's slow, you don't have bikes, you don't have traffic going through, you're going there to kind of enjoy the space rather than to just move from point A to point B. And I think that creating, you know, zones, that's one thing that I think the High Line did really interestingly is they have, you know, you kind of walk through and it's a whole, it's an experience, it's different things, you have different art exhibits, you have different kind of uh, designs of how things are, different plant species around. And I think creating these kind of rooms as you move through is one of the most exciting pieces in how you make this place really dynamic and, and interesting and something that I think will be, uh, you know, will start to keep going with and, and change throughout time. So yeah, I think that answers your question. Um, but more, more access is extremely important too. You know, getting more ways that people can get down. That's like, that, that, that's, something that needs to happen throughout the entire river. It's, it's, I, think, the um, I was in grad school when I was studying the river for a, a nonprofit organization. And the only thing that could uh, live in most of the Chicago River near the downtown is slugs. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm glad the quality has increased. I was curious to know if you've learned anything um, about the natural environment that you're creating and how much it mirrors what may have been here two or three hundred years ago in terms of the plant life, the biota, and things like that. Yeah, so you know, we, we kind of look at just what it was as that's, the, that's what we want to get to. You know, and part of it is like, you know, to get back to that area, you have to, we have to get rid of seawalls, we have to kind of do that. In our channel, I guess we have to <laughs> fill it in completely, but you know, it's, it's tough. So what we're trying to do kind of each year is find new ways to, to, to make this more like what it used to be. So. Uh, part of the one issue we have is our gardens, they float on top of it. But in a real river system, you have a few things happening. You have water, you have a sloped edge where water can go, where plants are sometimes coming out of the water and sometimes underneath submerged. You also have flows that go up and down. And if this is floating, the whole thing goes there. So we're trying to find different ways to emulate some of these things and really kind of bring a lot of this back to a real kind of natural system and so that's uh, I think a real important part and in terms of the plants and stuff that we've used you know we try to make sure that everything well we do make sure everything is you know Illinois native and it's kind of something that's been there for a long time a long time so you know ideally all the plants that we have are plants that you might have seen you know back in the uh, before we really were there yeah exactly yeah back here hi um, so I think this is incredibly wonderful. Thank you for your talk. Um, I'm uh, concerned about the trees. I can't imagine them floating. And then you mentioned a swamp white oak, which I happen to know is just a gigantic tree when it's mature. What, what's the thinking behind having a gigantic tree floating? Yeah, so you know, you want to create just this real, like a 3D environment. So you want things where birds and other things can hang out and actually live within the system. And so a lot of the areas you have some, you know, shrubs and things that go over, but you're, you're kind of lacking on some of this, this habitat. So that's kind of the, the goal in that, you know, we'll see how long it goes for. I, ideally, this thing will kind of grow to its point, you know, we can prune it as, as need be and, you know, it'll, it'll stay there for, for 
ever. But eventually, the other option is it gets too big, it's too crazy, and it sinks. And we, 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 we have to put it in the water. But that's also great because what that happens is, you know, the river bottom, as I was kind of alluding to earlier, is, is, is just this mud, it's thick sludge. And so you don't have structure for fish and other things to live on. So sinking a tree then becomes just, it's like, uh, if you ever see those videos of, you know, like the whale carcasses in the ocean and how it becomes this, as it degrades, it becomes this really interesting ecosystem. That's like kind of what will happen, I think, with these trees is they come down and you sink them down. You start to then, it, it then creates a, a life of its own for a different type of species. So I think, you know, all in all, you know, if, if the beavers don't get to them, you know, I think that's what's, that's the, the end of life kind of situation for them, which is you know, probably pretty nice by tree standards. I, if I can pretend I know how they think. Hi. Um, I know you mentioned the High Line, and earlier you were talking about environmental education. Um, and the problem that I know the High Line, I'm from essentially where the High Line is, yeah. um, is that like it's, there's a lot of access for tourists, tourists, and there's not a lot of access for students from nearby schools or for environmental education to take place in a meaningful way. Um, I know it's in the beginning stages, but do you have ideas of how to like keep access equal or equitable? Yeah, so, you know, this, we, first you have to have more spots to get in, is, is, is just a, the, for the physical barrier. But the other thing is in creating programming focused on the residents, and luckily for us, like, it's, we're a little bit off the beaten path of where you know, you'll go. If you're a tourist in Chicago, you're going on the river walk downtown, and that's like the first thing you'll, you'll probably do, and you'll probably get less coming to this area, but you know, I think it's really great as we're, we're hoping that that probably will shift. But creating programs right off the bat and opportunities for people who are kind of residents to actually start this stuff and be involved from the beginning in, in, in using it, I think is a key piece. You know, when you create something like this, this public open space, you know, you have to make sure that the public knows how to use it and knows they can use it and they can create a club that meets there or, or do some sort of experiments and things like that. So I think that's part of the key uh, to this area. In terms of the, the other tricky question, which I, I don't really have a great answer for, is, you know, how does this work with, like, property values rising and people who live in the area? You know, the, the area itself has... Um, a, is right by the old uh, Cabrini Green. So there's a lot of public housing already there that's, you know, that's not going anywhere, it's staying there. So it's, it, it's great in, in terms of that, that there's a lot of people who, um, low-income residents who aren't gonna get priced out because of any of these things coming in. So that's, I guess, a, a benefit, but it's a harder piece than for the other people who live in the area. I don't know really what, uh, um, you know, I don't really, I think that there's different models in terms of how some of these parks get financed that can help alleviate some of that. And I think that hopefully as this thing goes, as the city starts to get more involved in this, you know, we take those steps to, to really make sure that this always stays as a, a really interesting place for the people who live in the area, not just some, you know, tourist trap that's kind of not really a part of the culture of Chicago. I think this uh, is probably going to be our last question. We're about to wrap up. I don't know whether to ask my big question or my little question, or if two would be permitted. One is, I'll, I'll ask both, and you can cut me off. Um, one is real quick. You mentioned that the metal pieces that hold back the, the land from the river are like eight, nine feet tall because of the industrial boating past. Mm -hmm. um, is it, from an engineering standpoint or legal, whatever, possible to take that down and grade the land so that you have easier access without having to build a whole different set of structure? And the, the bigger question, is with the Lincoln Yards development that apparently is going to go through. I think they have lots of riverfront, don't they? As yeah. part of that, yeah. So in exchange for all of our TIF dollars and whatnot, would this not be something that the city could require and say you will keep this publicly accessible and you will do this kind of uh, structures and you know promote educational events and whatnot, uh, not just make it the patio for your high-priced restaurants or? Yeah, yeah. So. In terms of uh, taking down the seawall, so there's some deal with um, the Army Corps. So our map, we're, one of the parts that's taken the permit so long is it's based off of a map that was made in 1896 that shows the navigable waterways in the section. And that's what they use like to, to, the, to the T to base off how far you can go in the river based on obstructions that have not been there for 100 years. So it's, it's, it's 
to, in order to take down the seawall, the two approaches is one, you take it down and you grade it into the property, and the other is you take it down and you grade it into the river. Into the river is much harder to do in terms of getting it through uh, the Coast Guard, the Army Corps, IDNR, and CDOT, and all that stuff. Taking it to your own property is much easier, although you then have, you know, in order to grade this right, you got to take a lot of your property down. And for most of these areas, you know, it's like you're going to be taking up a, a big chunk of the land to do this kind of grading. I think more places, especially park space, should do that. They should build these inland pieces, kind of wetland areas, and kind of recreate that natural thing. But I think for in most any commercial development or residential development and stuff like that, it's just it, it wouldn't be feasible for them to do. Um, but what the I think that'd be pretty cool. Um, but the, the other thing is, um, as one of the things we're working with the Army Corps on is deauthorizing this river section. So it's authorized as a navigable channel, even though in practice you can't navigate it. So then how do you, if it's deauthorized, then you lose a lot of the regulation goes along with like the navigable standards that need to be maintained for kind of com commerce. So then you get that opportunity to then go deeper into the river and build some of these more natural banks and things like that. So I think that's the other kind of solution to that. Um, in terms of Lincoln Yards, they do, they have a lot of river access. I mean, this area, that area itself is like, you know, it's, the whole place is frozen in time as it was a planned manufacturing district. And you kind of then, it, it stays in a similar way. And now that's kind of, as Finkel Steel left, the whole dynamic has changed. So you're getting all this new development in these places. And so I think that as these things go in, they have, you, you have to make these things um, and I think the, I think the developers are actually are making the, the the docks and the access that they have public access that you could use you know year round. And with the REI development, that's definitely what what we have going on is there's you know uh, um, it's public access that you could do. And I think that's that's extremely important because if you're if you have an area that's um, if you're building and rehabbing in a, a, a building, you have to make sure that this then becomes a piece for the entire public to be able to use and to be able to actually access and, and become part of the whole river system. So I think that it should be a requirement. And I think the city does totally push as all these developments go in. And part of the framework plan is to, to, to kind of set the, the tone like this is what you got to do or you're not going to get the permit. So like that, that type of thing is like, I think, necessary because if you look at what, one thing that I think Daly did is he put this 30 foot setback requirement. So anyone who redevelops a property is required to do a 30 foot river walk setback. And that in itself is a really interesting solution for if you're trying to connect the whole thing over, it takes you know, decades and decades before everybody redoes their development, but then you start to get this continuous river trail just by the nature of people changing the properties. And that type of idea, I think, is the way to approach these and, and you know, have access be part of the, the paradigm and what you need to do to actually engage in the river system and redevelop these things. Because if we have just desperate parts that are miles apart, it's not going to really be the system that we want it to be. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Nick. Cool.